Welcome back. Thanks for being with us for the NEU Jazz Festival 2021. Uh, we're happy to have a bunch of master classes presented by our great guest artists as well as NEU faculty over the course of the couple of days of the festival. Uh, today and next up is uh, Russell Schmidt. Uh, Russ is a fantastic pianist, composer and arranger as well as educator, of course. Uh, he leads the Valley Jazz Cooperative and works uh, through the educational programs and, and manages the educational programs for MSW. And so we're really happy to have him as a featured guest artist for the festival. Let's have a round of applause for Russ Schmidt and his rhythm section master class. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do to start today, an important thing to me uh, in rhythm section performance that I don't always hear enough of is communication. A lot of times I'll hear rhythm sections that play in parallel, but they don't always communicate. And I'll actually turn around to this collection of uh, individuals and ask them a question, which I'll restate here in a second. So have you ever seen a student combo recital or something like that, where perhaps the bass separates from a comping instrument by two beats or a bar, and the tune proceeds to be long in parallel for the remainder of the tune? Yeah, okay, great. So we've all seen this. So I'm asking about if someone in the rhythm section gets off and instead of being in lockstep, we play in parallel incorrectly for maybe three or four in, uh, minutes. That for me is always as an audience member sitting out there listening to a jazz group, that's always one of the biggest bummers for me because it tells me at some level, musicians on stage are only listening to each other at the most superficial level. They're listening to each other to be sure everybody stays in relatively the same tempo, but they're off harmonically, they're off formally, and that's kind of a drag. So I want to start from an aspect of communication in the rhythm section, and then we'll move on to some other topics as there are need for the players here or interest if they want to ask me questions. Um, the musicians ready to go right now happen to know Jerome Kern's All the Things You Are, so I'm going to move away for a second, and I'd love for you to play a quartet treatment of it right now, if that's okay. Cool. Great. And we'll rotate others in a bit. Thank you. 
So uh, one of the things that I want to start with is uh, acknowledging things that I thought were real successful in that. So we had Eric on bass and Steve on drums, and there was a lot of good, subtle communication between you two on, for instance, four-beat feel, two-beat feel, how intense the four-beat feel might be, you know, whether it's a really a uh, hard driving straight ahead or more of a chill straight ahead. There was good communication there. Eric, you had great communication to piano. The piano didn't immediately join you on intro as outro. But you, you know, in some ways you kind of broadened your chest a little like, can we go here please, right? And I also saw, I also saw examples of sort of physical representation at the end of the guitar solo, where you're like, hey brother, I'm done, I'm only taking a chorus, let's wind things down and move on to you. So there were examples there, 
that I thought were examples of really good communication. There are opportunities for us to communicate even more effectively. So I don't want to diminish anyone with what I say, so please know it's framed, framed in the context of wanting to help you do better next time. Don't take anything as personally wounding, okay? Steve, when I hear your interaction with others, I hear you actively listening, and that's awesome and sounds great. But I learned this in 1997. I went to a, a jazz thing that Bob Brookmeyer was running. And he had a concept on, on communication that was like your communication should be developmental at least a little more than it's imitative. We all do imitative communication. But if it can migrate into being developmental a little more, you know, at least 51% of the time or whatever, that would be ideal. So sometimes I heard the communication you do and this is Bob Brookmeyer's bit, I want to give him credit. I hear it as being like trying to have a conversation with a minor bird. You know what a minor bird is? Okay. So it's a type of bird that can imitate human speech, but of course it doesn't know what it's saying. It can just imitate it. You can teach your minor bird, you know, to say hello or pretty baby. And your conversation with a minor bird is hello. Hello. Pretty baby. Pretty baby. You know, and that, that's kind of a line of bird's day. So we want to elevate our communication. We want to elevate our interaction so it's more dialogue-based instead of imitative monologue-based. So sometimes someone would play a triplet, and you'd give the triplet right back to them, and when they stop, you stop. And I like to go deeper than that. Can you take something you're being fed by another player and develop it, not in a way that's self-aggrandizing, not in a way that's like, oh, it's not his solo anymore? You don't need to do it to that extreme. But you do need to go ahead and accept that his solo, it's kind of a monologue, but what it really is, it's a dialogue that he gets to dominate. So his solo is a dialogue that he gets to run the show for about 85% of it, and 15% of the time, you two are surging in and kind of like, oh, I have a good idea based on what you just did and, and transform it. Do something different with that idea so that it feeds the solo with new data, new information. And if we're doing that, then what's going to happen is we're listening at that deeper level that will never allow a group to play fat and dial one bar apart for three choruses in a row. It's a way of developing your ears in real time, it's gotta be reactive, but you're trying to have a conversation with someone who you're letting dominate the conversation, it's their solo. But converse with them, don't just imitate them. At the piano, I say, everything you did, two comments come to mind had a sameness to it orchestrational. So I want you to think about, do you play any classical piano? Uh, yes. Okay. How much sustain pedal do you use in Haydn? Not a lot. Okay, how much sustain pedal do you use in Chopin? A lot more. Yeah, okay. So just right there, the instrument has orchestrational possibilities. If you're playing some really early keyboard music, it hangs more towards the middle of the keyboard because they didn't have 88 keys yet, right? It hangs more towards the middle. But you get to Brahms and man, the whole thing. You get to Rachmaninoff, boom, smash, crash, it's all over the place. So you live in a narrow bandwidth, and I want you to maybe expand that because that allows you to communicate in different ways to the group. And then you hung out more of a, yeah, Sonny Clark, Quentin Kelly, Fred Garland type of comping life, I think there's more options than that. Those are great options, but it's 2021. I think there's more options. <laughs> than that. And then the more, it's like uh, in the Avengers, right? You see the Avengers movies? Yes. Okay, what's up with Hawkeye's quiver? It has a near infinite number of uh, arrows in it, 
right? Yeah. Like Doctor Who's TARDIS, they can't be, you know, it's bigger on the inside than the outside. Okay? So the point is there's endless possibilities, and I think you could have endless possibilities with the keyboard, and you're very, very happy with a narrow bandwidth. So I want you to expand that because then you can communicate with others more. So expand your quiver of arrows. Because right now it's living in a lot of the same thing. So I want to start at piano, but I'm going to move around and make suggestions to everybody, okay? And then we'll rotate some other players up here so that we get everybody to play in the 45 minutes we have. All right, so will you let me be the pianist for the moment? Okay. So let's see. Um, can we just start in the guitar solo? Okay. So I want you to take two chords at this time, and then I want you to take one chord, Eric, sorry, it's the, it's the Keith Jarrett in me suppressing the Jerry Peacock, so <laughs> two chords here, one chord there, just to be able to demonstrate some things, okay? Uh, count off the tempo you want to blow at, brother.
somebody's reading a Nestico chart, a really straight ahead big band chart, and it isn't that Sammy Nestico is always living in a straight ahead realm, but the sort of things of his, the GIP program, have historically been more straight ahead. If you have stuff in bass and drums where you're supposed to play, the band director isn't going to love it if you make the artistic choice to drop out for 32 months. Okay? <laughs> you don't have that choice. You do. So think of the sonic landscape that's created when I'm like, yeah, I don't need to count for him. And then guitar comes in, Jonah comes in, and fills the space, and we made eye contact, and I'm like, yeah, I don't need to run the show, and he got in and did some beautiful comping. I could still get in, as I did the halfway through point, but I wasn't really comping. I was thinking about the keyboard like an orchestrator. What's missing? Okay, so I want you to think 
mid-range, solid. Swinging and punctuated, solid. Let me just do one thing to demonstrate another thing. Space hold. Here we go. One, two, um, two, three, um. <laughs> Sometimes if the music isn't energized, it wouldn't hurt for him, he's not supposed to go over here, but it wouldn't hurt for him to get just a little early to energize the music. And I just felt there were a few moments of that. Your melody making is great. I want to say about your improvisation, I'd love it if you can think of fresh things to communicate at the ends of your phrases. The ends of your phrases end it very similarly. So if we were to convert your music, your melody making, into, into text, and in the terminology of, of English language, every one of your sentences ends with a period. I'd love it if some of your sentences ended with an exclamation point. I'd love it if some of them would end with a dot, 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 you know? <laughs> and maybe that's just a whole note once in a while or something. But they all have a similarity to how they end. So it's like the, you know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Yeah. Okay. So you know how Ben Stein, the teacher, speaks? Bueller, Bueller, that guy? If every one of your phrases ends the same, there's a hint of monotony there. And that doesn't mean it sounds bad. What you played was great. But you can make it more exciting at the end. We can just kind of hang at the end. But if everything is through the sameness there, and over time I started to perceive some sameness in your tone. So I had to think about how you punctuate the end. 
Okay? And now the last point, and we'll get the other players up. Why did I just palm cluster the trader? Because you were generating rhythmic ideas for me to feed off of. Right. And did that sound, I mean, harmonically it sounds horrid. <laughs> Sonically, did it have logic behind it? Yeah. Did it make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. So at some point, the technique doesn't matter. It's about what are you trying to communicate? That had logic behind it, and it made sense, even if it was chaos harmonically. There's logic, and because there's logic, then there's something for you to grab onto, and you can communicate to it. And I felt you did, and I took, you kind of shot a triplet, a fast triplet, maybe it was a eighth triplet or a sixteenth triplet, even at the ends of one of your chords, and I'm like, okay, but, but you know, I'm just trying to go fast. But it's because I'm trying to take your thing and then develop it as the start of my own thing. So um, I'm glad you played ball with me. I love that. I want you to bring that level of playing ball with everybody else as they solo. But it's also incumbent on everybody else. Leave some room in your solos or end a phrase with a whole note. Ah, that space that someone else can step into. Because your solo is your dialogue that you get to dominate. Okay? Cool. Rotate! And wipe down and disinfect. And, uh, I'll take a second. Got till 12.45? Great. So I'll take a second to talk about the orchestration thing for guitar and piano while we're trading over and tidying up behind me. For a number of uh, summers, I taught in Wisconsin at the Birch Creek uh, summer jazz camp. Jeff Campbell, who heads the jazz program at Eastman, he also has run that thing for at least 20 years. And it had a really neat thing where there was a curtain just to the edge of the stage, and, and the stage was actually put inside an old barn. They reclaimed an old barn, blew out the sides, and made it a covered indoor-outdoor concert space. But there was a curtain right at the edge of the stage. And so I could have two or three of my high school jazz piano students watch me play with the faculty big band. And we had a faculty big band combined of faculty plus a couple of saxes and trombones that were dorm RAs to keep high school kids from getting into trouble. So we had a faculty big band. They would always ask me after the concert was over, why did you play so little? I might play 60% of the time in a big band when I have flashes. And it's because there's nothing I could add that would make the music better. If the music is in the mood, and let this hand represent the saxes, and this hand represent the trumpets and the trombones. What can I contribute as a comper there? There's nothing I can contribute except clutter. So I'm thinking about my role as a comping instrument, as an orchestrational role. I want to contribute something that makes the music better. And if there's no room to talk, then go ahead and hush up, musically speaking, and it doesn't matter that you have chord symbols in a really busy, dense, sad Jones big band chart shout chord. Maybe the pianist doesn't need to do anything. Or maybe they just need to do octaves apart, melody tidbit, once in a while of a fill, but do I really need to count? And so that's something to think about. Let's see, Julie, may I ask you to, because we're running out of time, I want to give space here, I'll ask you to be a, a supporting partner in a concert, but maybe not a solo. Are you also good on all the things you are, or do you want to take a different tune? No guitar solo this time. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
recorded for posterity, you watch. You go back and you look, because I was watching you to see what was the level of uh, communication. He did a triplet thing, and you did a crescendoing triplet thing in response in your comments. Right? Then you get a little louder and more strident, and like, I'm here to say something, right? Yeah. And then you imitated that, and you looked up to do it. You're like, oh, this is a thing now? Boom, 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 boom. And you looked up for that. That penetrated your brain, which right now is thinking of, oh my gosh, do I know the changes in autumn leaves? Do I know the voicings I want to play? And you're so actively processing what you need to to succeed in the chord scale and the harmonic voicing and stuff that the communication went away. So I want you to work on knowing the changes and the voicings and whatever you need, like the back of your hand, so that you can get in the moment in time. Because the thing that penetrated your consciousness was a bit of 
handing off of this rhythmic floating. You look and you'll see your head go up. Like, oh, cool. That sounds fun. I want to get in on that. You need to get in on that as much as you can. For you, if you get stuck in a moment like that, and you have to take another chord, because I've been on bandstand when the trumpeter is at the bar when it's time for the head out because he's trying to hit on a young woman at the bar. That's true. It's like, well, okay. I guess I'll start Donnelly without you. You know, whatever. <laughs> then be nimble on your feet. The thing to communicate is to turn your body like, okay, I guess we're doing bass and drum training, which limits you sonically. You know, you got to be softer. But I would have started trading there and not taken another full chord. It's kind of like, that would be the moment to communicate to the drummer, okay, something over here ain't right. Let's take leadership as a duo, okay? So, um, so just keep working on active forms of communication. I'm looking, I got about one minute left, and I'm going to use it with our friend Josh at the kit. We didn't get to do anything. Okay. Uh, Free presentation. You have no idea where it's going. Neither do I. Tell me you have to start on it. Uh, e flat. E flat. Okay. Is that E flat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> improvisation and that gives me an opportunity to work on communication. I could do the same thing with other bandmates but we're out of time but I'm glad you perceived what I perceived. Our communication got better as it went along and maybe that expands your comfort level so the panic disappears, you know. So always work on communicating with your rhythm section mates and uh, do your best to know the things you need to know, the changes, the form, phrase length and so forth, so that you can really be communicative in the moment and not waste too much frontal processing power of what I need to do to play the tune right. True? Okay. Uh, my name is Rush Schmidt, and that's the end of our rhythm section class today. Please continue to attend online these uh, NAU Jazz Festival uh, uh, clinics and concerts. There's a concert tonight and tomorrow night and a number of clinics still coming up. Thank you and goodbye, Internet.